So now what will happen is, instead of this, suppose I have take some spare, which may have some thickness also, but the point O should be outside this set X, well, outside this set S. Now the question is, suppose you have two real value continuous functions on such a set S. Now, there is nothing like antipodal pair because some rays will intersect the spheres in intervals, not just in one point. So his conjecture was, even then, there exist two points which are on opposite rays, which go to the same point. That was Borsuk's conjecture. And that is uh, what I did in my thesis, that I proved that conjecture. And later on, of course, Borsuk showed interest in it, and he invited uh, for his journal, which was Fundamenta Mathematica, Polish journal, very respected at that time. So this was a side track because Borsuk's name came. Uh, that is a good practice, by the way. Normally, uh, whenever I go for any talk, usually my name is given, of course, because otherwise the people wouldn't know who is this guy. But other things are not mentioned so nicely as it was done to I suppose it is your initiative. OK, that's very nice. So it's worth applauding, and uh, I thought it well. I'll mention it. Now, today's topic is not this, though. Today's topic is another very famous person, Yuri Horn. Now, that name you have heard. You have heard. Uh, by the way, I made a slightly wrong comment. This is uh, the next one. Yuri Horn. Here is on. No, that, that page here, this page here. Uh, just Paul, here is on. And oh, where is that page? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. That page is missing. Anyway, it doesn't matter. That missing page said Paul, here is on. And just gave its date, uh, year of birth. and. So year of birth was 1898. Maybe I'll correct it here. So there is a minor mistake in my book. I wrote about Urizon that he died at the age of 24. Now, after this, I came to learn that I was slightly wrong. He died at the age of 26, not 24. But still, it is remarkable that in this short span of life, he produced a theorem which is studied uh, now today. This year is exactly one century after his death. And still, everybody, everybody in topology studies uh, Eurizon's lemma or Eurizon metrization theorem. By the way, uh, Eurizon metrization theorem is the main theorem. And a lemma is a subsidiary step. But in the case of Eurizon lemma, the lemma itself is so unusual that uh, that is a milestone. Now, I'll talk a little bit about what's so great about Eurizon's lemma, although it is also explained here. Uh, but before that, let me encourage some especially younger students to ask this questions which are not likely to be asked in any examination. Like compactness, there are so many theorems about compactness, compactness. What is the root or what is the origin of this importance of 
compactness in topology. Can anybody tell? Where does it originate? Now, what is the... See, the definition of a compact is very easy. What is it? Anybody? Yeah, anybody? Please speak up. Everybody knows it, I know. Yes, every open cover has... So the keyword is finite. Finite. If instead of that finite, we put countable, what do you get? That is Lindelof. Lindelof. Lindelof space. There are, of course, there are some theorems about Lindelof spaces, no doubt. But it's not like compactness. Compactness is the next best thing to finiteness. That you can elaborate many times. Okay, for example, every continuous function on a finite set is bounded. In fact, every function is bounded. But the net, if you take an unbounded set, then it need not be bounded. But on a compact set, it remains bounded. So compactness is the next best thing to finiteness. So why is finite so important in topology? Where is the origin of that word in topology? Yes? That's it, precisely, precisely. If you take the definition of a topological space, it is a collection of sets. So that the empty set is there, the entire set is there, it is closed in the unions, but as far as intersections are concerned, it is closed under finite intersections. So that's where it starts. That's why compactness becomes so important. If the definition were it is a collection of sets which is closed under arbitrary unions and under countable intersections, then Lindelof might have a better time, but still there are many things which fail for countable, which work for finite. Okay? So that's why it is important. So similarly, let me ask you, what is so great? about Yuruvah's lemma. Can you uh, get Yuruvah's statement of Yuruvah's lemma? No, no, that is... Uh, ah, okay, okay. Uh, why is it called a path breaker? It opens a new direction, but what's so unusual? I mean, suppose you have an ordinal space. And you have to close some space. Then, Yuvizan's lemma says that the rest of did I keep it here? Ah, uh, yeah. There exists such that this goes to zero, this goes to one. In fact, you may suppose the function is only on this, okay? Fine, now you might say, it. what's so great about it? Real numbers we use every day. If I change this to If you 
change this to a matrix space, then such a function is very easy to construct. Right? Why you, are, you take what is called the distance that d of xa means the shortest distance or the infimum, infimum of all possible distances of various points you take x. Well, so there will be some point at which we are the minimum, that is the distance. So what is the if x is a point of A, then what is its distance from A? Zero. It is already in A. More generally, if x is in the closure of A, then also but here of course A is a closed set, so it is already its own closure. And what about B? What about B? For points of B, this function will be positive. Right? It may not be 1, but that can be adjusted. I mean, by doing some scaling, it can be adjusted. So, it's so easy to construct such a function if x is a metric space. But then what's so remarkable about your results level? Why is it that a result which is not so remarkable for metric spaces becomes extremely remarkable for normal spaces? Think about such questions. You uh, might not ever have to answer them in ordinary exams, okay? But you are getting bored by the lecture, I suppose. Okay, never mind. Uh, but you might expect such functions at interviews. So they are not totally relevant as far as your jobs are concerned. So, Make it a habit to ask such questions. What is it in normal space which make these? So, can anybody? Uh, it is answered in the book, but so this is a moral test. How closely my book is followed here? it is a topological normal space. So nothing is given to you that even has the slightest connotation of a real valued function. 
In fact, a person who studies topology need not know what are real numbers. They, they don't come into the picture. Only with Urizan's lemma, for the first time, they come into the picture. So that is the great thing about it. And <laughs> Urizan calls it lemma, but actually it itself is a non-trivial theorem, but Urizan called it lemma because he used it as a preparatory step for another result, which is Urizan metrization theorem. And usually that is how far we go. And the proof is interesting. <coughs> uh, can we have that Urizan metrization theorem? Ha! Huh. That is Urizan's lemma that uh, you will find. Ha! Huh. Now, what is the idea of this proof? Uh, why is it that? T3 plus second countable implies metrizable because the first step is T3 plus Lindelof implies not. So the question really is what, what are the main steps? Yeah, first prove normality, after that apply embedding lemma for a countable family of maps. Usually, uh, a single function will not do the trick. When you want to embed something, like if you want to embed a sphere into uh, the real line, it is impossible. It is impossible. If you want to embed the two sphere into plane, is it possible? Is it possible to embed the sphere into a plane that is R2. Is it possible? No, just now I said that Borsopalam theorem trivially proves as a corollary that S2 cannot be embedded into R2 because there is no one to one continuous function from S2 to R2. Okay? Borsopalam uh, theorem actually does a lot more. It says not only it takes the same value at two points, but at a at some antiboder points. That is the non-trivial part. Three functions. Can you embed the sphere into uh, uh, R three? That is the question. Will there be a family of three functions which will work to embed the sphere? Can you embed S two into R three? Yes? Think? This is one of those googlies. Can you embed S2 into R3? Come on. If you, if, if you are appearing for an interview and uh, if this question is asked, I doubt it, but your ideal answer to that person would be, are you trying to fool me? Because S2 is already a part of R3. Where is the question of embedding? It is there. It is there. Already it is a part of R3. So there exists from S2 to R3. R3, that means R, R, and R. There exists a embedding, or we can say that there exists a family of three functions. Family of three functions, which together give an embedding. Now, what is it? Or how, how big a family do we need to get an embedding? Because we already saw that no single real valued function will embed S2 into R1. Not even two functions will embed S2 into R2. You need three functions. Okay? And more generally, for Sn, you need n plus 1 functions, not 
n functions will not be enough so now the embedding lemma tells you or it gives you a sufficient condition for a family of real valued functions to be enough so that a given space can be embedded into the product of that many copies of the unit interval or any other spaces well again that is a standard part of the syllab uh, syllabus the crucial point is that the collection sure well one is separate points and or distinguished points 